Hello all, it is the official start time of the meeting. However, Glenn, our, our lead chair for uh, shepherding this, is currently having audio issues. So he's trying to sort that out and we'll get going in a little bit. In the meantime, while he's working on this, if anybody is eager to jump up and take the role of note taker, we'd love to hear from you. This is Barbara. I can help with notes. Thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, the, you can use the Cody, uh, of course. But of course. Oh, oh we hear Glenn now. Awesome. That's progress. <laughs> I can now hear you and you can hear me. Excellent. One second with the slides in. I had to do a reboot. <laughs> I had suggested to Glenn in chat, have you tried turning it off and back on again? So apparently the IT still works. All right, one more second here. Be ready. Sorry about that. I logged in. I couldn't hear audio. I couldn't send audio. I'll mention also that while Glenn is still doing this, if anybody is not microphone enabled and would like to bring something to the mic, um, it's easy enough for me to just jab or scribe without having to find another um, volunteer to do it. So I'll keep an eye on chat. And if uh, you preface your line with mic, I will know that this is something you want said uh, to the group. All right. Can everyone see the slides at this point? Yes. All right. Then shall we get started, sir? Please do. OK. Welcome, everybody, to ADD, uh, session number one at ITF 109. Uh, as you are aware, all ITF sessions are covered by NoteWell, so we are as well. Uh, we have a pretty simple agenda today, but I think it's going to fill the hour very nicely. Um, uh, we have uh, the blue sheets, which I guess are now automatic. Uh, we have a scribe selection, which sounds like it's been taken care of. We've displayed note well. Uh, the uh, agenda bash, I'll do in a second. Uh, but we essentially have a presentation to start off with by Tommy Pauly, uh, who has a, uh, a zero zero draft to go over. Uh, there is a bunch of material in this zero zero draft, which will talk about the concept of equivalent resolvers, which is something that was introduced by draft box ADD requirements. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll do uh, the presentation by Tommy, uh, and then we'll uh, do some basic questions. But the meat of it, the, this concept of equivalent resolvers, we'll have as a separate discussion after that draft is presented. Uh, and that will probably take most of the hour. Uh, and then we'll have a, a very quick, at the very end, five minutes, probably not even that, a uh, quick discussion about session number two, which is a two-hour session scheduled for this coming Friday. So I'll open up any any additions or changes to this, uh, or removals, changes to this draft agenda. OK, moving on. 
So uh, I'm Glenn Dean, one of your co-chairs, and David Lawrence is my uh, other co-chair of ADD, and our area director is Barry Leva. Tommy, um, are you on the line? You're Hello. muted, Tommy. All right. I think it, the audio just takes a while to connect. Can you hear me now? Oh, we can. Let me switch over to your slides. Give me one second here. I have this all nicely set up before I did the reboot. <laughs> and of course, the reboot threw it all away. All right. There's your slides. Let me know when you want me to go to the next slide, and I'll just hit, sit back, and you're in the driver's seat, Tommy. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. So what I'll be sharing today is a, a simplified proposal that um, some of us, the authors listed here on the slide, have worked on since our previous interim meeting. And we've called this uh, proposal DEAR the discovery of equivalent encrypt encrypted resolvers. And this is largely um, reflecting the scope that the working group seemed to want to take um, based on our interim meeting discussions of saying, let's just have a very um, simple use case in which we want to discover the, actually the equivalent encrypted resolver for a network um, given that I already know an address. Um, as the chair has mentioned, we'll need to go into more details on what equivalent really means and what are the guarantees we get from that. Does it actually give you any security properties or any um, trust properties or not? But this proposal hopefully can give some concrete details that help us think about one way that this discovery mechanism can work. Next slide, please. All right, so what are equivalent resolvers? And that's, again, something that needs to be discussed. The way that we initially defined it here, um, we essentially had two options. And we talk about how to address both. One is when there's a very simple case in which I have another DNS protocol that's available on the same IP address, on the same server. So this is saying, I got provisioned a particular IP address, and I can speak DNS over TLS to it, but I can also speak DNS over HTTPS. There's some degree to which this may be viewed as equivalent. Um, a stronger version of this that's authenticated is when we can have some certificate that claims ownership over both of these um, such that I could actually have two different IP addresses for my resolvers, but have some level of um, proof that these are related or managed by the same entity. Next slide. All right. So in this draft, we define two different use cases that we're trying to enable discovery of encrypted resolvers for. The first case is when you already have an IP address of a resolver, generally a um, unencrypted DNS over port 53 resolver, and you want to discover what is the one or multiple equivalent encrypted resolvers I can access for this. Um, and this address could come from a network provisioning protocol or be typed in manually. It could just be essentially saying, I am aware of um, 8.8.8.8, .8 but I don't know if it supports dot or do or how to get to those. Tell me about those um, pieces of information. The other use case is one in which you already know the name of an encrypted resolver, but you want to discover the properties of that resolver, like what are the port or the URL path for do that you need to access, and essentially what are the lists of the different protocols that it does support. 
one thing that we specifically do not cover is any type of um, discovery of non-equivalent encrypted resolvers, such as um, some upstream resolver that may not be able to be um, covered by a common certificate or share an IP address. Next slide, please. So the mechanism that we just dis uh, we discussed using for discovery is based on a draft that Ben Schwartz wrote up for describing the properties of a DNS resolver in a DNS record itself. So he wrote up how to use a service binding record, an SVCB record, to list out essentially alternative services that a resolver offers. So in this case, we can have a DNS server, for example, .NET, and we can get different records, one that indicates that it supports Doe using HTTP2 and has a specific um, URI template. And then I can also have an indication in another record that says it also supports dot. And maybe it has an alternative host name that it's using dot dot example dot net, and it has a specific port it's running on. And this can be expanded to support DNS over quick or any other future protocol. Um, we're kind of relying that on that as a separate document um, and really just talking about how to apply it for a discovery use case. Next slide, please. So for the first use case, when we have an IP address and we essentially just want to upgrade from unencrypted DNS to encrypted DNS, the IP address, as I mentioned before, can be provisioned in a number of different ways. It can come from the network, such as over DHCP or RAs. It can come from a VPN protocol. It can be entered manually by the user. Each of these different use cases um, or these different provisioning mechanisms has different trust properties. Um, maybe, maybe you trust DHCP and RA. Um, maybe you have RA guard on your network, but there's not a lot of um, user trust in who really is this that's provisioning that information, oftentimes. A VPN or a user entered value may be different, and that may be something that we have more trust in. And so some of the guarantees that we get from upgrading discovery um, could be stronger. For this approach, the draft defines sending a query for a special use domain name. It proposes reserving something like resolver.arpa so that you do a query for DNS resolver.arpa. And you can get from, so you send that query to the address of your normal DNS over 53 server. So I can send a query to quad eight, let's say for this special use domain name, and it could send me um, in the response, one or more answers for equivalent resolvers, which will represent the different protocols that this resolver supports. Next slide, please. For this case, we um, discussed two different modes in which you can do it. There is um, what I think would be the preferred mode, which is to have it be an authenticated upgrade. And you know, what are we trying to authenticate here? In this case, we are saying that the certificate of the encrypted resolver that we end up connecting to must include the original IP address that we knew about, quad eight or whatever else it is, in its um, subject alternative name list, along with the name of the resolver itself. And um, this mode should absolutely be required if the IP address is different, because otherwise we have no way to prevent a number of attacks that would allow an attacker to divert encrypted DNS tracker to the traffic to themselves. Um, it also came up on the list um, in the discussion with Ecker that you could also require the SAN to cover the IP address of the encrypted resolver itself. That's something that we had discussed and thought about before, um, but we we're not sure about the threat model and if that's something that we needed to cover. But that's something I think we should discuss. The other mode is an opportunistic mode in which um, 
you aren't able to cover um, anything or validate anything in the certificate itself, the draft recommends that this mode only be used when the IP address of the encrypted resolver is identical to the one of the unencrypted resolver. Um, so that essentially it is, as far as you know, the same entity that you're talking to. Um, this is a, you know, I, I want to use encrypted DNS because I think it's better than nothing, um, but it's not proving anything about how much you should trust that entity other than saying it looks like the same person you would have been talking to anyway. Next slide, please. So the other use case is discovery using a known name. Um, you may already know a resolver name in, for a couple of different reasons. One, we may be defining new mechanisms to provision a resolver name. You could add the name of the resolver to DHCP, RAs, it could be in a PVD, it could be in a VPN configuration item. If we go down this road, this allows us to not put all of the details about DOE and DOT or DNS over QUIC into DHCP options directly, but only have them define the name of the resolver and then use further DNS queries to enumerate all the DNS details afterwards. The name could also be something that's entered manually. Um, being able to enter a resolver name may be simpler than having a user type in a uh, full DOE URI template. Um, it's also an interesting use case if you have an encrypted resolver that you know about, but you can't access it. So maybe the ports for DOT are blocked, but you want to discover if there's an equivalent DOE resolver um, when you only had DOT configured before. Next slide, please. So in this case, we don't use the special use domain name, but instead we can simply do a query for the resolver name that we already knew about. Um, so this is really just using a uh, Benchworth document kind of as is, um, but explaining kind of how it's used in this deployment. And in this case, the cer certificate must cover the originally known name. Um, in general, that's going to be the same thing, but it's possible that, let's say, a dot server has a slightly different name than the DOE server, any certificate would need to cover both to prove that it's really the same um, equivalent resolver that you're accessing. Next slide, please. So th that's the um, proposal um, at hand. If there are any questions about the mechanism, I'd like to hear that. And other than that, I think this can be a good starting place for our discussion about equivalency. Yeah, so the one thing I'd ask is for people to uh, keep their uh, questions focused on everything except for the concept of basic equivalency that we're going to have an extended discussion uh, after this. So. Please. Uh, hang on. Uh, yes, I am managing the queue, but I don't have the buttons at the moment that are, oh, I just you, enabled my You just have to tell them to unmute themselves. You just call them up and yeah. they'll unmute themselves. Okay, so, well, that, that, that was it then. Eric, please. EKR. Yeah, um, so thinking about this uh, name version as opposed to IP version, uh, mm -hmm. it seems like it has the same problem that I mentioned with respect to the IP version, but is not fixed by the same fix, which is to say that if you don't trust the resolution of that name, then the attacker can redirect themselves through you, can redirect you through themselves, um, thus controlling your source IP address. Is that correct? Okay, so let's say I, I know well, okay, so, so I, I know like a dns.google for dot, I learn about its Doe properties I connect to dns.google with Doe now. I, in that case, it sounds like that's an attack that could happen regardless of the discovery mechanism, that just trying to reach out 
to the DNS server by name, the encrypted DNS server by name has that problem regardless of any extra discovery. Yeah, if I wasn't correct. already with, it, with a hard coded IP address. Yeah, I think that's correct. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's just kind of a more general property of not kind of having a hard coded address along with your crypto resolver name. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Martin Thompson, please. It takes a little while, doesn't it? Uh, so uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm really not very clear on why you have multiple reference identities when you or when you seem to have a clear reference identity. So if you've discovered something uh, through, for instance, DHCP, and mm -hmm. the um, uh, DHCP is giving you an IP address, then you look for an IP address SAN, right? And that's yep. all you need. If you got DNS.Google then you look for dns.google in the certificate and that's all you need. The draft seemed to say something about multiple reference identities and that was very confusing to me. Um, you kept talking about having extra names or something and then there was an extra name that you would get through the service B record, for instance, and then you would validate that as well as the IP address. Oh, I see. so right, in, in this case, you would be let, let's say yeah you the dcp gives you quad eight um you look up quad eight and it says my i have a doe resolver which is dns.google slash dns query um i, I right. think it's just saying kind of by default your sand should cover the name that's in the uri like if if, if the uri you're accessing has a name in it you're validating that anyway. And in addition, you should validate the IP address. I, I think maybe we should kind of clarify the language. Please. Yeah, that, that's all I was trying to say. OK. Yep. Thank you, Martin. Ralph Weber, please. Uh. Ralph is sharing his screen. There it's the wrong button. Still need audio. Yeah, we see you. you. Need to click on the audio button. Can people hear me now? Now we can. Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. Sorry. Let me chop it. In. So um, the first question is: I mean, we are you are talking about the discovery of a resolver, but it is uh, often the case in today's world that people have configured more than one resolver and one might be upgradable and, and the other not. Uh, is there any, uh, I mean, how do you want to handle that that case? And the second question is the, uh, uh, I mean, private IP addresses, we uh, we can't kind of have certificates about, um, but it is a very common use case. Now, if I read the draft correct, it is kind of okay for it to just do kind of, for instance, dot 853 without checking the IP address? Is that correct on my, how I understand it? Um, yeah. So, to, to your first question um, about multiple, I, I think that goes more into how the client would end up you know, using this information in presence of having some that are upgradable, some are not. We don't get into that here. I'm not sure if we should get into that. We're just talking about the mechanism. and. For the private IP address space, the kind of the one thing we allow for in that is um, the opportunistic mode, which says if you can if you manage to host the same resolver on the the encrypted resolver on the same IP address, that's okay. But beyond that, um, we'll need a, a new um, a new mechanism. And I, I think. And there, there is no checking. I mean, it, 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 it was, I don't, I'm not sure what you could actually check there because it's a private IP address, yeah, supposedly. Exactly. Yeah, it, there's not much to check, and I think there are two ways forward for networks that have 
um, like a resolver forwarder that's on a private IP address. Either they figure out how to host some encrypted DNS on that, or we add in something like a name into DHCP or RA um, that will say, here's the name of the alternate encrypted DNS server that you can go out and reach to. Okay. Thank you very much, Ben Schwartz. Hi. Uh, so I wanted to talk about Ecker's interesting observation that uh, an attacker in the network could redirect your encrypted stream in order to uh, in order to make your apparent client IP different from the vantage point of the server that you're talking to, even if you have an authenticated connection to the server. Uh, so I think that's that's an interesting and novel observation, um, but I think that we should declare it out of scope. Uh, and my reasoning is that client IPs are not validated in TLS, so that's a security property of the secure transport that HTTPS inherits, for example. The whole web uh, has the same problem. And uh, DNS over TLS inherits because it uses TLS and DNS over HTTPS inherits. So uh, I think we should just say that this, that's out of scope. And if we do want to come up with security protocols that can uh, prove the client IP from the vantage point of the server or something like that, then um, we should come back to that later. Uh, I wanted to. Um, uh, agree with Martin Thompson that uh, let's not turn the service B target name into a reference identity if we can yeah. possibly avoid it. Yeah. Um, and uh, more generally, the, the same IP restriction I think is really interesting. Uh, and I've said this, I think, on the list, but I think that the same IP restriction is is based on a, a threat model that I haven't quite heard stated precisely and that I'd like to get stated precisely somewhere. I think this goes to our um, next segment discussion about what equivalence really means. So uh, I'd like to think some about that. My, my suspicion right now is that this comes down to a um, transient to persistent attack upgrade concern. Yeah, yes. OK, thanks. Thank you, Ben. David. Hi, David Skenazi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, it works. Cool. So I was wondering, and it's kind of more of a 10,000 foot question, but uh, so one, uh, when our team on Chrome uh, was, you know, it, well, is working on Doe, one of the uh, well, the techniques we use is kind of like auto upgrading to the same IP. And one of the main failings of that technique is that the majority of users have uh, conf or are configured with a DNS resolver that's you know in 1918 space. Uh, pretty much, you know, it's your little whatever Wi-Fi router you bought is your DNS resolver. Does this do anything to help us with those devices, or are those considered out of scope for for this proposal? The, the the private address on the local network case, right? Yeah. Saying? Yeah. So I, I think the question is, in those networks, how are they adding support for encrypted DNS, right? Because presumably you're trying to find out what is that network's encrypted DNS server. So I, I mean, well, no, well, but, but that's actually my, my point is that they're not. Um, it, the great majority of users on this planet have a router that they don't update the firmware for, and so that's not going to get encrypted DNS. And so are, is that a problem that you're not trying to tackle? And if that's out of scope, that's totally fine. I'm just trying to make sure what the bounds are. Right. It, it is not something that we think has a clear solution that doesn't open up another attack. There are certainly ways that you know we can update those networks, but it is possible that there are going to be certain um, routers that if they don't update and they you know, don't let certain options be passed through, that you will not be able to just upgrade them to 
the equivalent one um, without having some other provisioning of like the name that you should be using for that network customer. Yeah, no, just the, the cause I, I think this is and will remain the majority of users and it's like, I would love to have a solution for them, but if this isn't it, that's fine. It just means we need to yeah. have another yeah. solution. I so I to try to find a solution for anyone, <laughs> uh, you know, not just that case. And that case seems to have a lot of my fields in it. Okay, I, I mean, and, and that's reasonable. We can start somewhere that's easier and then build up from there. Cool, thank you. Thank you, David. Becker. Yeah, so I, I actually think um, this mechanism is fighting with that a little bit. Um, so, I mean, the the semantics of your opportunistic, right, are you say, please go to IP blah, and if IP mm -hmm. blah happens to match the IP you have to resolve, or the mission accomplished, you upgrade, right? But the situation that David's talking about, which is quite a common situation, is where the, uh, um, the client knows one IP, and the server is unaware of that IP, but it's actually the case that if you just connected to that IP, it might not work, right? Um, and um, so I think, you know, I, I, I mean, I actually have a question. What, happen, what happens with these devices if you just connect to like the IP, the, the, the IP and try to do TLS? I don't know, do you? Oh, so like the, 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 the what, choke? Like the route of known <laughs> yeah. Does it choke? address? Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to find out. Um, I mean, this is actually going to be, I guess, for for, D, for a DNS curve, right? Because DNS curve uh, theoretically works through these devices. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and to be clear, like our opportunistic proposal here was defining what it means to do it opportunistically based on the hint from the special use domain name answer. Right. Um, so that that is something that could still be you know, theoretically filtered out by a network um, right well I'm, I'm assuming that i'm assuming these devices aren't trying to stop you they just don't care right right um yeah they're trying to stop you at like game over right but um yeah i mean i think i think the, I think the interesting question to ask is is there some mechanism i think as david says is there some mechanism where is there some set of cases where in the where, you, where what you have is basically a um a pretty dumb forwarding resolver to one of the large, you know, uh, to, to, to one of the large, uh, you know, resolve, resolver farms in the world that would take dot or do if you had it. And like, and you can talk to it because, because the resolver doesn't try to filter the traffic. Is there some way to upgrade dough in those cases? Um, yeah. And it feels like and I, 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 it's not quite clear how to do that, but that seems like a problem which you worth worth working on if, I mean, we've sort of chosen in this case to pick some very restrictive threat models, but there's a very restrictive, like, um, you know, use case model like that. Like, it, it's really only like one of 10 resolvers. Is there some way to fix the problem? Yeah. There's, you know, one other point with these forwarders, um, when we talk about the definition of equivalency, I'm wondering, like, is it true that they yeah. would be equivalent to whatever it is? Because if they are a forwarder that is technically intercepting the messages, they often yeah. do some level of filtering or they have some extra override for showing you the page of your router sure. when you load the other page. Yep. And skipping it would change it. So it kind of yeah. goes outside of the definition of this really is the same resolver. And if you yeah. want something that is equivalent, you need to change your original resolver. Yeah, and do you, I mean, do you have any data on? I mean, actually, for David, for David too, do you have any data on a fraction of like, um, you know, apparent result of resolvers actually, uh, you know, have some nineteen eighteen address? Uh, we don't currently have that, but that's something. Yeah, that we, we don't either. Get. Yeah, but it sounds like a worthwhile thing to collect metrics. And, and I think, so I think that the case, the relevant cases, I think, like people who don't have some obviously hand configured address, like one 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 one, and also don't have like um, an also not nineteen address, are also doing it. Um, right. Okay. And there are also a lot of networks that do give out, um, you know, other resolver IP addresses. Like I think a lot of Comcast networks, you know, their CPEs and stuff will give. Addresses that are not private addresses. No, that are right, not. right, right. Well, that's the case. That's the that's the thing we should be. That's what I want to measure. So, yeah. Thank you, Ecker. Tiru, please.
Your mic is not transmitting. Tiru, are you here? Oh, okay, his mic is coming online. I think there's some problem with us. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yes, now we can. Hello. 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 Hello, we hear you. Hello. Uh-oh. Everybody else besides me hears him, right? Yeah. Um, yep. But Tiru has turned off his mic. So let's, uh, while he sorts that out, Martin. Oh, Tiru might be back, though, so. Hello. Um, OK. We, can you hear us, Tiru? We hear you. Okay, uh, I'll send them a side channel message. Yes, uh, we can hear you. I'm sending a chat message to him. Okay, let me reconnect. Sorry, guys, I think this one should come out with audio. Sorry for that. Martin, please continue. I was going to continue this conversation that Eka and Tommy were having here and uh, suggest that perhaps the the case that they're talking about where someone has the 1918 address and the, the dumb forwarder kind of works in this case because you make the query to the special use domain name and you get back an IP address and you just connect to it and use do or dot or whatever it is that it tells you to do and we're done here because what we're looking at here is a case where you don't have a reference identity necessarily. Uh, it does mean that uh, you don't get any of the properties that we might be interested in in terms of um, being able to rely on the DHCP or RA providing something that we might trust um, with scare quotes, but uh, I think it gets, it gets a lot of what we're kind of looking for in the end. So. For those cases that I'm interested in, particularly the case where we're looking to say, go to the uh, DO server that's being provided by an ISP outside of the home network, then I think we'll, what we have is, this is probably enough for that use case. So essentially you're saying, relax any checks and just say, the addresses don't match, but just use it anyway. You don't have a reference identity in that case, right? Um, and then the question is, what what name do you go go looking for? And and that's a little bit challenging. But um, you've already started out in a in completely insecure context with no um, no real trust in anything. So uh, I don't know. It's even weaker than the than the other model where you accept that the DHCP is is secure. But it could work. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. I mean, we need to consider the fact that it, it creates a essentially an encrypted channel to someone who may be an attacker. Um, it, it allows them to up, it allows them to do that if they can essentially successfully inject one packet to you and trick you. Um, whereas before, in order to intercept all of your DNS traffic, they had to do it continually. So it's the kind of temporary versus persistent attack. Yeah. It's not not a great position to be in, but um, no. it's it seems yeah. to be more, an option it's, it's, that we take. True. Yeah, it, it's it's certainly an option, and some people may want to do it, some people may not. And and so one one reason I pointed that out is that we potentially have a context, particularly with our trusted recursive resolver program, where there are certain identities that we might be willing to connect to anyway, and and mm. others that we yeah. think we wouldn't. And so that right. gives us a, potentially a path to doing that sort of thing. Right? Right, right. So essentially, an alternative way of blessing the results. Say, yeah, even if you are lying to me, you're sending me to a legitimate place, so I'll take it. Yeah, exactly. Sounds good. Yep. Thank you, Martin. Uh, one of the things I'll note is that we are 40 minutes into our 60 minute session, and this has been a really good conversation. And there's still a couple people in the queue, and. Uh, could well be another couple. While we did have another item on the agenda uh, about talking about resolver equivalents, um, that will also probably um, take 
a, a fair bit of time. And so we will just plan on rolling that discussion into the next session. Um, so we're not cutting off, as long as this conversation is still being productive, we're gonna keep this one going as long as it takes right now. So uh, David, please. Hey, David Skenazi again, Chrome. Um, so I, first off, I want to answer um, Edgar's question about uh, numbers. So these are numbers collected by Eric Orth uh, on Chrome. Um, apparently, what Chrome sees worldwide is um, only 15% of users have non-private addresses configured for their DNS. So 85% of users, the vast majority of the internet, is configured with a 1918 DNS resolver. So whatever Wi-Fi router you bought 10 years ago, that's your DNS resolver. Uh, another stat that could be interesting to folks is of those 15%, half of them map to known DOS servers like Quad8, Quad1, and so forth. Um, so all, all this to say, like we, it sounds like we're building a solution for an incredibly small minority of users, and that sounds like not necessarily the first priority to me. Um, I, I, I want to also second like what MT was saying. You could make this, you know, parts of this work uh, by using queries that go through your um, cheap old router to something to something that might understand them in the ISP network if the ISP is willing to stand up dough. Um, my personal two cents is uh, that's even if that's not properly vetted and trusted, it's still better than what we have today where everything is in the clear. So uh, maybe kind of weakening the security model here might improve user security. Yeah, that's good. And th thanks for the stats on that. That's very useful to have. Um, you know, one option that also comes to mind is we can have potentially different recommendations for what to do when we have 1918 addresses, and essentially allow more uh, loosey-goosey opportunistic um, upgrade when you have a private address that you know can't be authenticated versus if someone has configured quad one or quad eight and making sure that that cannot be attacked. Okay, thank you, um, David and Tommy, on to Ben. So Ben Schwartz, uh, so I've heard a few different suggestions of ways that you could potentially key a loosening of the matching requirements in opportunistic mode. Um, so I heard something about um, match keying that on the basis of whether the IP is RxE 1918. I heard um, keying it on the basis of whether the uh, encrypted resolver IP is on a list of known uh, nicely behaved resolvers. Another condition that I think could be interesting is if the client knows more about the network that it's on. So for example, if the, if the configuration came to the client in, in an IPv6 RA and the client has some way to assess the network and say this network probably does not have RA guard functionality, uh, then that would be maybe another case where we can say there's essentially nothing to protect here. Uh, and so we can be we can be more open to redirection. Yes, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Ben. We're gonna try Kiru again. Hello guys, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hey, can you hear hey thanks for that. Hey, okay, hey, uh, I mean, this draft is a great start. Uh, so what we are doing to solve the private IP addresses problem, at least on the routers where uh, we have our security services, what we are trying to do is uh, we are using Acme, where uh, either the ISP or the security provider would uh, give an, a unique uh, I, uh, domain name. And then we are using Acme to assign a uh, certificate to that so that uh, what would happen uh, is that the endpoint would be still be able to use TLS with the uh, uh, DOH or DOT forwarder hosted on the router. And then if the router still continues to use uh, private IP addresses for uh, serving uh, the de encrypted DNS service, but that will be only visible to the uh, endpoint devices connected to the home and not to anybody else outside the home network. 
but where we are currently stuck at with regard to uh, our draft is reform draft is referring to using dhcp ra to solve that problem and uh, we have a dependency on the router to support that but uh, uh, it's not clear if we uh, move to a dns based mechanism for discovery how would that work and how would uh, that problem be solved uh tommy do you want to uh, I don't think I have any particular comments for that one. Okay, great. Uh, so, Tiru, anything else? Uh, no, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ecker, please. So, like, I, I have to admit, I expected the numbers to be not as bad as David indicated. Um, <laughs> those are pretty terrible. Um, uh, I, mean, I think we really, um, like, I think in light of that, we need to really go back and ask what we're trying to do here. Um, because if what we're trying, I mean, if you go back and you say like, you, and you, if, if you, I mean, I mean it, it sounds to me like if we're not solving the problem of people who have like 1982 as, as a resolver, then we're like not doing very much useful. So, um, like, like maybe we gotta go back and ask like how to solve that problem and then see if that, if that, pro that problem extends to the other things. But I mean, like, I know, I know Stratford is all a problem you think you can solve, but I think like, I mean, if we know that 85% of people like have the problem, some other problem, then we need to figure that problem out. Um, and I think, you know, this has been useful to flush that out, but, um, and this is for the chairs, like we really need to, I think we really need to like, you know, we need to figure out the problem definition at this point. Uh, definitely agree on that and we're working toward that. Um, I will note that uh, with Eric's last comments, that was actually the end of the queue, but there's also been quite a lot of active discussion in Jabber. If anybody there uh, would, this is your kind of your last call, you think that you've made a salient comment there that should actually make it into the notes and, and come to the rest of the group, then please step forward. Another couple of seconds or I'll hand it back to Glenn. Okay, Glenn, off to you again. Awesome. Let me show my screen here. Let's see how much time do we have left? Oh. All right. Um, so uh, the next topic we're going to talk about is equivalent resolvers. And I was really happy to be able to finally use this um, clip art of apples and oranges. <laughs> So um, this is a, a slide that Chris Box has made, uh, pulling uh, out the definition uh, that is currently in uh, draft box ADD requirements, which uh, is uh, what the deer draft, uh, my understanding, was based upon. And so we thought that, given that there was some discussion about this on the list, and this is kind of a, an important sort of discussion point that the deer draft is based upon, we thought that it'd be really good uh, topic of conversation uh, for us to explore what this group really wants to tease this out to mean. Uh, so I'll, I'll read, you know, for, for everybody here, uh, what is equivalence? Given two resolvers, A and B, equivalence is the claim that A and B can provide the same upper layer DNS function, i.e. response messages towards the client. This does not include the DNS transport protocol, such as uh, regular DOE 53 or DNS over HTTPS or, or DOT, um, which can uh, differ between equivalent resolvers. Uh, so far, there's been two modes of how you assert this claim of equivalence. One would be network identified, where uh, somewhere at the network level, either through the DHCP or RA, uh, there is this uh, information tr given out that says, hey, B is equivalent to A, and you can go with that. Uh, and then there's a resolver identified where uh, resolver A uh, says that B is equivalent to it. So with that, um, I, I'm gonna just open the floor and let people discuss how, what is your interpretation of equivalence? Do you see this um, definition as we have it now as being sufficient and complete? Do we need to further tease out some cases around it? Uh, sort of, let's explore this topic, have at it. We'll run it, this until about five minutes before the end of the session, which will then cut off the queue and we'll pick up this conversation 
uh, on the Friday session when we when we uh, have it in the end of the week. Okay, David, I'll turn it back over to you to manage the queue. Martin, please. So many permission dialogues. I had a slightly different thing, but I think this one's mostly okay. So my um, my kind of understanding was, um, I said, what did I say? I said, um, whatever resolver you currently have, assume that you got that through means that is absolutely secure and you can communicate it with it through means that are also absolutely secure. Um, then using that information, um, find an equivalent DOH or DOT resolver that you can use on a completely insecure network. Um, and that's a different way of formulating that. Um, and it, it still has the same sort of constraints on it in terms of network identification and resolver identification. But um, I'm, I'm moderately happy with this with this formulation. I can't see anything wrong with it aside from that. Great. Thank you, Martin. Ecker? As I indicated on the list, I'm not happy with this formulation, and I'm actually surprised Martin is because what Martin said is incredibly different from the simulation. Like this formulation could absolutely inv include Resolver, which gave you the same answers, but posted your like responses to posted your queries to Twitter, which surely is not okay. Um, so, um, uh, including one which is operated by the attacker. So I think um, you know, I, I sent some text to the list. Um, I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's more in the right lines than this. Is that it, Ecker? Oh, yes, I just forgot. Yeah, I know. OK, thank you. Uh, ben, please. Hey, so to reiterate something I've said many times now, I think the we need to talk about a temporal component here, uh, about whether two resolvers um, not only are equivalent, but are going to stay equivalent. Because if there's an attacker who, in our model, can can uh, can be present only briefly, then I think that that changes our conception of what it means to be equivalent. Uh, yep, Ted, please. So the point I wanted to make was actually about the response messages, and I think that the Concern I have is if somebody tries to test, is this in fact equivalent by continuing to ask both for some period of time? Um, that the response messages could be different from the two different ones, even though their behavior toward the rest of the domain name system is in fact the same. Just because unless they're actually serving out of the same cache um, and you know using the same mechanics upstream to query the um, either if it's a forward to the upstream uh, resolver or the authoritatives, they can get different answers just because of the behavior of the rest of the system changing over time in ways that is not related to the function of the resolver. Um, so I think we, we want to be careful about giving a simple test like the response messages you would get from A and B would be the same. I think that the, the claim that they provide the same upper layer functionality is closer but much less well defined and i think you'd actually have to write down what what pieces of that dns functionality are in fact the same in order to get it um something that the the client could be sure of and i i do worry that most of that is completely untestable by the uh the client so they're they're going to get an assertion but there's no way for them to confirm it um, except the response messages which might give you false data Thank you, Ted. Mike Bishop, please. Um, I just wanted to note that um, the definition of equivalence that was used earlier was that it is managed by the same entity or at the same IP address. I think this is at least a step in a better direction that um, even two DNS servers managed by the same entity might deliberately have different policies and behave in different ways. So 
you know, the filtering and the non-filtering DNS endpoints, for example, can't be equivalent. But yeah, and there's more complexity than just it gives you the same response right now because it might not, but it provides the same service. I don't know how better to quantify that though. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, I'll mention now that we are closing the queue. Um, well, uh, Ralph drop when Eric joins. So Eric, you'll you'll be in queue. Um, and DKG, please. Jim, you're, you're gonna have to save it for next session. Uh, Daniel Van Gilmore, ACLU. Um, so I want to echo what other folks have said here. Uh, that that looking at the response messages is uh, extremely weak for the questions that I think we care about here. The reason that we're doing you know, DNS privacy and these other transports of change is that there are a lot of factors beyond just what answers do you get. Um, Ecker pointed out, you know, what about a DNS server that um, that sends to Twitter, that republishes to Twitter? Uh, but there are several others. I wanted to point out that uh, latency may be another factor in terms of the cache. Um, Linkability, whether the peer can even link your queries across time, uh, whether the peer requires client authentication. Hey everyone. Looks like we had to do a, a reboot. Do we have DKG back yet? That was really interesting what he was saying. I'm back. Um, I don't know exactly where where the, the split happened, <laughs> but I just wanted to echo, I think what Ecker and Ted were saying, um, which is that the, the reason that we're doing DNS privacy, the reason that we're running into these problems here now anyway, is that there's far more than uh, did I get the same records uh, that we care about when we're talking to a DNS resolver? Ecker's description of you know something that goes to Twitter that republishes all the queries to Twitter is just one factor, right? There's other questions about latency, about the ability of the resolver to do link up to, to link the client's queries across time, whether that's with cookies or TLS sessions or whatever, whether the uh, resolver does client authentication, that kind of thing. So so I, I just think that this definition is way too weak to 
to decide in the context that we're talking about. Now. And Dan, I'm, I'm going to jump in and pause you right there because that's a great final statement. Um, uh, I don't know if we got it into the notes because I think some of the oh, some of the notes are getting captured now. But thank you, Barbara, because um, I think everyone's just sort of coming back from uh, the Mido Mideco incident. So uh, we're at time. Uh, and so I, I, I would hope to end this a little bit more <laughs> gracefully than, than this. Uh, let me say this. So we're going to carry over this conversation because it's a good conversation that we're having. Uh, we can have it on the list between now and Friday, but we're going to pick up on Friday with this topic and this conversation and with the addition of the material that's going to be, I expect will be discussed on the list because now you're all uh, focused on the concept of equivalence and the discussion. So, David, are you yeah. back? Do you want any last words? I am. Well, I would just want to encourage because I know Chris, John Reed, and Eric were all at Worth were all in the uh, queue. Um, so make a note, please, of what it was you wanted to say so that you can bring it to the next session. And with that, thank you, everybody, for session number one. Thank you for the folks uh, in the East Coast of the United States that are staying up. And we'll see you on Friday and on the list. Uh, good night. Good morning, wherever you are. <laughs>